All right. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for blessing us with another opportunity to gather and, and sing your praise. And we pray that as we open up your Bible and, and, and seek to honor you in our lives, that you would give us uh, minds and hearts that would, would trust your word, believe your word, and, and be given the strength to obey your word. Um, not that we would um, think that we can do it perfectly or apart from your strength, but that we would trust in you and in everything that comes from your word. I pray this all in, 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 your, in your son's name, uh, believing that this is how you would have us to think and, and how you would have us to even feel about things like our body. I pray this in, in his name. Amen. All right. Uh, we talked about uh, transgenderism last week, um, and I said that I wanted to um, talk a little bit about what the Bible thank you, says uh, concerning the body. How should you think and feel about your body? And this isn't just a, an issue facing some people out there. This is an issue facing everyone, right? Our, our world that we live in is, is, is constantly suggesting to us that we should think and feel a certain way, but we should always be pressing back and saying, how does God want me to think and feel? And particularly in the transgender movement, the whole issue of how you feel about you is critical. And you, you try to detach the you from your body, your physical body. And that's why I wanted to talk about your body today. But just a quick reminder, this is what uh, transgenderism says in their own words about about the body and about the self and the, the soul. It, once again, they, they would define your sex as something you are given at birth and, and described at, as being you know, defined by your body, but they would define your gender as something totally different than your sex. Your gender is how you feel. You may look like like a man or a woman on the inside, but you do not truly know your gender until you have uh, understood what you feel yourself to be and what you think about yourself. So you'll hear phrases like this all the time. I was born in a boy's body, but never felt like it on the inside. I tried to do boy things, but I could never shake my feelings. And the world today says, okay, then you're, you're transgender. You must be different on the inside than the way you are on the outside and you should enter into this process called transition where you try to conform the outside of your body to the inside of your body or there's a really famous story about um, a family I think they're fairly conservative actually um, who had a little girl and her first words um, because she was deaf her first words were I am a boy and then she continued to tell her parents over and over again, I want to be a boy, I don't want to be a girl. And she'd even threaten them and say, once you guys are dead, I'm going to cut my hair and I'm going to be a boy. And their, her parents panicked and things like this, and they started doing some research and talking to some specialists, and then they came to the conclusion, little Ryland must be transgender. So then they started referring to her as a him, and now they say, and they've made a lot of money on books, and now they say uh, that he has never been happier in his entire life. But once again, this is based on the feelings and desires of a, of a four-year-old, three-year-old, two-year-old. You know, it's just like, okay, let's be a little bit more careful. Let's be a little more cautious. Where the older, maybe, version of transgenderism was trying to be a little bit more careful, you know, prescribing, you know, a year of therapy before you do surgery. It seems as though we're living in a world where you're jumping into um, hormone therapy and and lots of life-altering surgeries that will change your life forever based on how you feel. Once again, that's transgenderism. And I couldn't help, but um, it's impossible to not come across illustrations for transgenderism. And I don't want to be too graphic or too vivid, but this was just in the news this last week. This was a video designed for fourth and fifth graders uh, from uh, Wisconsin, where I come from, considered a fairly conservative part of the world. But this is what is being pumped into schools of fourth graders and fifth graders. I won't even show you the video, but this has a, a young kid explaining uh, gender, the truth of gender, to adults. And it's kind of like a mockery of, of adults in a, in, a, in a sense. So there's one of the, the, 
the stills from the video. Silly doctors, it's w way more complicated than just saying you are who your body says you are. You can look one way on the outside and be totally different on the inside. You, you, you adults, you doctors, you know nothing. Us kids, we know everything. And then, then she goes on to, to explain how your sex refers to the physical parts of your body. But there is also something called your gender, which is different. It sounds to me like they're just making up terms at, the point, at this point. But uh, your gender, which is how you feel on the inside. You may look like a boy on the outside, but if you feel like a girl on the inside, your gender is actually a girl. And that would, of course, lead them to say you should pursue these things. Your gender, how you feel on the inside, doesn't always match your sex uh, you were called when you were born. This is just the basic truth that's being uh, spread everywhere. And, and honestly, I, I don't want to talk about this because I, I, I think this is actually a, uh, a, an extreme deviation from the Word of God, and I don't want to even expose this to you, but the reason I'm showing you this is so that we can say this is what is being said to you guys in, in your life. And, and, and mild forms of this are being said to you in cartoons all the time. You've got to be true to yourself. You've got you, you to find your true you. Do you. You know, all these phrases that we hear in cartoons all the time are telling us to disregard our outside and really, really focus in and idolize and try to identify ourselves by how we feel on the inside. There is a belief, there is a thought that this will lead to joy. But once again, this is a very novel thing and people are kind of making it up as they go without evidence of how it will impact. Uh, but the basic thesis of the movement is, right, it's, it's, it's basically my body, my choice. I can choose what I want to do with it. it doesn't, it's not anybody else's body. It's my body. And if I feel like I don't want to have this body anymore, if I don't like a certain part of this body, it's my right to change whatever I don't like. But really, think about this. The transgender movement really just fuels a lot of what? It fuels body hate. It says, you, if you don't like a part of you, should remove it, should cut it off, should say there's, there's no point to it, and I don't want it in my life or on me anymore. It actually is fueling a problem that has, has dominated for a long time, and that is to not like yourself. If you don't like yourself, you better change yourself through radical surgery. But, but is this a biblical position? Is, is this how the Bible tells us to deal with ourselves and think about ourselves? You should not like parts of yourself if your inside disagrees with your outside. Now, there, perhaps the, the transgender movement will poke at you as a Christian and they'll say things like, hey, isn't Christianity all about being nice and being compassionate and being sympathetic and trying to, trying to you know, you know, remove the pain that some people are feeling. If someone is just really troubled by their body, shouldn't you, wouldn't the compassionate thing to do be to let them pursue what their feelings are telling them to pursue? Well, that's, that's, there's, a, there's a bigger question there. First, first off, that's, that's like an evangelism question. What does it mean to be a Christian? What, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Some people would say it means to be compassionate and loving and accepting of all people. Some people actually say that's what it means to be a Christian. I would submit to you that what it means to be a Christian is to believe everything that the Bible says about you, your world, God, and your body. That's what it means to be a Christian. I mean, we could extend that definition out all over the place, but that's what it means to be a Christian. Ultimately, it means you believe everything that God says to you about everything. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means I believe what God tells me about himself, that he is creator, that he is my sovereign, that he's my owner. It means you say, I believe everything that God tells me about me, that I am sinful by nature, that I am a rebel against God by nature, and that that is why I sin, because not, I don't just sin because I'm a good person trying to be good but messing up all the time. I, I, I sin because I'm a sinner on the inside. I come out sinful. And, and that also means that you believe what God says about the solution as well, right? God sent his son into the world to live a full, perfect life on my behalf, and die a death that I deserved so that I would not be judged for my sin, but that I could stand before God in Christ's righteousness. That's what you believe when you say you're a Christian. You believe all these things, and you believe many things more. And I would submit to you, 
that there's some things that we need to believe and hold fast to about what the Bible says about the, the body. And so here's kind of like a few questions I want to answer. What does the Bible say about my body and how should you as a Christian think about your body? This is what we're going to ask and be answering or seeking to answer. Once again, our series is just questions worth answering. I think there's lots of questions in our world and I want to help you answer them in your own mind. And, and I'll kind of answer these questions in a, in a two-part way. First off, I'm going to submit to you that the Bible holds a very high view of the body. The Bible holds a very high view of the body. And then secondly, what I'm going to show you today, this morning, is that the gospel demands an even higher view of the body. So the the Bible holds a very high view of the body, but believing the gospel demands an even higher view of the gospel uh, of the body. So it's you're it's one thing to just be a human. It's a total another thing to be a Christian as well. So that that's what I'm going to kind of talk through with you. Let's let's talk about the first point though. The Bible holds a high and honorable view of the body, of your body. You cannot believe the Bible and not hold a very high and honorable view of you and your body. In order to uh, be discouraged about your body, I won't, maybe I shouldn't say it that way, in order, to, in order to hate your body, in order to think your body is... Is, is evil, you have to actually diminish the view that the Bible has of your body. But you, you can't diminish and you can't disregard the body and believe the Bible, I would say to you, at the same time. Now, now I'll get into the whole idea of like, well, what about the fallen nature? How does, that, how does that all intertwine with understanding the body? But let's just talk about this for a second. Uh, first off, the first verse you're going to want to think about is Genesis 1, where, where we get to creation itself. Genesis 1, 26 says that God, in making man, did something very different than the way he created everything else. He said, let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness. And then the purpose is so that they will have dominion over the sea and the birds and the sky and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and there. And then verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. So you see that God made us in his image, but he also made us with two genders, male and female. That is God's created design. And of course, you could look to places like Psalm 25 and see the connection between creation and ownership, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein, right? The fact that God created you in his image not only shows your purpose, but also shows that you belong to him, right? I I am I am I am a a person for the purpose of displaying and showing forth who God is. And in an imperfect sense, what God is like. That is what you were made for. We could also look over at Genesis 6, and this is after the fall. There seems to be a special sanctity given to life, particularly human life, because we are image bearers, right? God holds a very dim view of those who hold a dim view of human life in the body because we are image bearers. I don't know if you're trying to follow along with me. Turn over to Genesis 6 just to see it. Genesis 6, this is uh, Genesis 9. Don't want to make that mistake again. Uh, Genesis 9. This is after the flood when God is talking about the world and how it will work. But notice Genesis 9, verse 5. God says this about the person who kills another person. Now, this is not saying that God doesn't believe in the death penalty. This is just the, the violent attack, the violent attack of innocent life. How does God feel about people that harm human life? He says in in verse 5, Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every living thing I will require it. And from every man, from each man's brother, I will require the life of him. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Once again, the fact that you are an image bearer shows that you are significant. You are special. And, And if I could even say it like this, right? An attack on the body that is an image bearer of God is tantamount to an attack on God himself, right? 
if you attack man, you're, you're almost attacking God, and God says, I will attack you. Because, once again, not only are you owned by God, but you also are an image bearer of God. And, and the New Testament also picks up this idea of being an image bearer and therefore making sin greater, right? James 3.9 talks about how you, when you sin with your tongue against someone else, it is a great sin because you're sinning against the likeness of God. James says this, uh, with our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And James is just saying there, how, how, can, you, how can you praise God, but also curse God's image and God's likeness, right? In humanity you see the likeness of God, and you can't say one thing about God and then say another thing about your fellow humans. This, this is almost like kind of cursing God in a sense because we are made in the likeness. And of course, Jesus talks about, talks about the heart of things, right? And, and he doesn't go into the image bearer um, argument of things, but he says if you even think hateful thoughts in your head about someone else, it is akin to murdering them in your heart, right? God cares about the way, all to say, God cares about the way you think and act towards other people. And I would say, by implication, God cares about the way you think about the body he has given you as well, because you are an image bearer. Notice, a lot of those verses that I shared with you are after the fall. You still, even if it's imperfectly, even if it's weakly, you still carry the image of God and how you treat an image bearer, how you treat your own body, reflects on your view of God. Does that make sense? That's kind of just like, just like a logical progression. A man is different than every other created being. And how you treat man and how you treat man's body is reflective of how you view God. But I would also say God's creation and purpose extends to the deepest part of you as well. God created you. Turn over to Psalm 139. God created you um, in the womb, you could say. Psalm 39, once again, this is a a psalm of David. David is writing this psalm to draw out in us a burning heart of love and loyalty for God. This this psalm is meant to to draw out in us a, a longing to be with God, to know God, to be loyal to no one else like you're loyal to God, to live for no one else like you are living for God. You, 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 you want to say after this psalm, like he says in verse 21, uh, do I not hate those who hate you, O Yahweh? And do I not revile those who rise up against you? I hate them with utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. I, I be, because of this psalm, is, am loyal to you. Any enemy of you is an enemy of, of me, in a, in a sense. God's but this psalm is all about God's, loyal, God's knowledge of us. God's knowledge of us, his, his understanding in the way he created us. And, and such knowledge, when we, when, we, when we think about how intricately and wonderfully we are made, actually causes us to say, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow nobody else. And that's kind of what Psalm 139 is saying. It, God's knowledge demands our loyalty. And I want to, I've, already, I've already preached on this psalm Several times, I know, but I want to just remind you of a few points of this psalm. First off, um, you, you say to God through this psalm, your knowledge of me is perfect. That, that is what David is saying. Yahweh, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down. You are atten- intently acquainted with all of my ways. God has perfect knowledge of me. And notice this, he has perfect knowledge of you and your future as well. He knows everything. He is not caught off guard by anything in your life. He he is not surprised or shocked by feelings you feel. That's what these verses are saying. He understands, knows your thoughts even before you know them yourself. He knows who you are. He has perfect knowledge of you. But then David would also say in 7 through 12 that 
your presence beside me is pervasive. There is, there is no place I can go where you are not present, right? And, and, I, and I joke about, right, this is like, this is like the, the Star Wars picture here. We've got like, surely even if, if, I, if I take up the light of the morning, and if, I, and if I blitz across the galaxy, even if I move at the speed of light, you will find me there. I cannot escape you, right? right. The, the, uh, the empire picture of jumping out of light, light, space, uh, light speed. Man, they're there too, right? God is everywhere. God always finds me. He always knows where I am, and I can't escape him. There is no situation of life where I can depart from the presence of Yahweh. God is with me in everything, and he knows me well. The idea is that even in sickness and in death, you can't escape God. And that's tremendous good news for people that believe everything that God's word says about them. Because that means there is no situation, even the deepest darkness that I can be in, where God is not with me as well. And regardless of how I feel, the world may look dark to me, but notice what it says, even the darkness is not dark for you. You can always say, even though I can't see, even though I don't understand what's happening, I trust that you know all things and you see everything that's happening and it is light to you. That is great comfort to the person who believes God's word. And and then notice finally in verses 13 through 18, David also says, your will for me is precious. David, of course, moves here to the view of the womb, right? This was the the deepest, darkest, most secret place in the ancient mind. Nobody knew what happened in the womb in the ancient mind. Nobody knew what happened in the womb necessarily. But David says something incredible here. God intimately knew and created him from the beginning in the womb. God didn't make a mistake, in other words. Matter of fact, we we get that idea, right, in verse 13 and 14. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We always use this verse to talk about the sanctity of life in the womb and, and to fight against abortion and all these kinds of things. But this also means great things for you, too. It means God made you as well in some sense. According to his great creative design, he made you in the womb as well. And notice the the words there, he made you skillfully. This is David, the same guy who said, uh, iniquity, uh, I have had iniquity from my mother's womb. But he also says God's skill is on display from the mother's womb. And the word there, uh, knit me together, you formed me, you wove me in my mother's womb. That has an idea of like a, a tapestry. You have put me together as a beautiful picture of glory for your glory. But, but, but just notice this. This is, this is a theme repeated from Genesis 1, right? God made man as the high point of his creation. And he made man from the womb as the high point of his creation. And he made man in two genders as the high point of his creation. And he has made you skillfully in your mother's womb to display a beautiful picture, a a beautiful handiwork, masterpiece, right? Maybe you're thinking, man, that's not me. That's not my body. That's not my life. My life is not displaying any beautiful tapestry of God's glory. But that I'm just submit to you that the, you're just you know what a tapestry is. It's it's those those big those big you know carpets that they put on the floor and often they just hang up on the wall because they're so beautiful. But they're full of all these little strings that make up a big picture. Yeah, and if you look at the back of a tapestry, it looks terrible. And if you pull out one individual string of a tapestry, it doesn't make any sense at all why this would be beautiful. But when you put them all together, when you see it in the big picture, when you look you know, above uh, from a high view, you say, wow, that is a beautiful picture. That is a beautiful, skillful picture. And right now, you're just looking at one thread, right? But God, from the womb, has made you skillfully. God has made you skillfully. But notice, we also see something else. Not only are you made skillfully, you are made purposefully. Look at what it says in in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Some poetic language there, perhaps. Your eyes have seen my unshaped substance, and in your book 
all of them were written the days that were formed for me when as yet there was not one of them. Notice God is, is doing all of this on purpose. He is doing this according to a book of purposes that he has written out for you. Sounds a little bit like Ephesians 2.10, right? He, um, we've been saved for good works that God purposed beforehand that we should walk therein, right? God has, has purposes in making you skillfully the way he made you. And once again, you might not see, you might not see all those purposes on display when you're looking at one little thread. But if you're a believer, you've got to believe the Bible and saying, I don't understand. Sometimes this seems dark and black and bleak, and I don't totally understand what God's up to, but I'm going to trust that he is skillful and that he is purposeful in the way he's made me. Your full life, including even your struggles, are not detached from the purposefulness of God. Now, this is not saying that God has implanted all the sinful desires and attractions inside of you that you may have, but it's definitely not outside of God's controlling purpose for his glory, and ultimately your good through believing his word. But once again, what is the purpose? What is the purpose that God has created you skillfully the way he's created you? The answer to the question is always his own glory. And you might not totally know what that is, but you have to believe if you hold a Bible in your hand that I am on purpose. I am not a mistake. I am not an accident, right? I'm not just a clump of cells that just expanded and multiplied, right? I have been skillfully and purposefully woven from the beginning. Once again, I've said this before, but I want to just uh, kind of like push down on this a little bit more. Once again, if you believe the Bible, you cannot think of yourself and your body cheaply. You can't. The Bible does not allow a cheap view of your body, right? No human life, not even a fallen one, can be counted worthless or without purpose or a mistake or a mess up, right? You, you can't say that and believe what Scripture tells you. You can't also say someone is beyond God's purpose. You don't know, right? But you can't treat human life cheaply. We can't say, uh, the way I am doesn't really matter. I'm just going to change my outward body and change my gender because it doesn't matter. You can't treat human life cheaply. But also, secondly, you can't think about yourself and your body arrogantly as well. You can't read Psalm 139 and say, well, doesn't matter what I do. I can do whatever I want. My truth is what matters most, right? That's not why God has made you skillfully and wonderfully and purposefully. God has made you for his own glory. And when you arrogantly set your desires and your passions above God, you are thinking about yourself arrogantly. And and I would say to you, there is no joy. There is no true and lasting joy to be found for someone who sets themselves against a God who skillfully and wonderfully creates And and there's no sexual identity formed against the knowledge of God and his word that will ultimately bring you satisfaction. You will always be struggling inside of yourself, in division with yourself, until you simply say, I am choosing to believe God. You, You won't be beyond struggle. We all are not beyond struggle. But I am saying that you were made to be in this body and to relate to God in this body, and you will never find joy until you humble yourself before him. Once again, we we can't think of our bodies as cheap, and we can't think about our bodies arrogantly as well, right? And this leads us to kind of the the second half of the message. The the gospel even goes beyond this. So once again, the, the, the Bible itself holds a very, what, high and honorable view of the Bible. But when you look At the gospel, the gospel demands an even higher view of the body. You can't be, in other words, a creature, a human creation, and have a low and dishonorable view of the body. But but notice this, you, you definitely cannot be a Christian, someone who holds to the truths of the gospel as revealed in the word of God, and not have an exceedingly high view of your body. What you do in your body matters. That's, that's what you have to come away with when you look at the Bible as a Christian. And to do this, let's look over at uh, 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to be in 12. 
through 20. And all of that was just, this is my favorite preaching line, right? All of that was just introduction to get to 1 Corinthians 6, but we won't take very long in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, once again, uh, if, you, if you were at summer camp, if you remember any messages that I've ever given in 1 Corinthians, you know that the letter to 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians, and the letter of 2 Corinthians is really 4 Corinthians. It gets really confusing, but Paul had a long a long and difficult and arduous uh, communication correspondence with the Corinthian church, probably while he was in Ephesus um, on one of his missionary journeys. And, and they had a lot of problems. Actually, you can kind of, you can, if, if you have a nickname for all of the churches in the Bible, the nickname that goes best for the Corinthian church is what? The, what are they? High school church. Yeah, you could go like that. <laughs> no, that's, that's mean. That's mean. Uh, we'll just say immature, right? Immature. Or, or fifth and sixth grade church, right? We'll just say that. We'll just say that. We don't want to make fun of ourselves. We'll make fun of other people, right? This is a letter written to an immature, a spiritually immature church. And, and the, the irony of Corinthians is always what? They thought they were really mature. They thought they were really spiritual, right? You read 1 Corinthians, you're like, these people really think they're great. They think they've arrived. Matter of fact, they probably are looking down on the church at Ephesus. They're probably looking down at the church in Philippi and saying, you people and spiritual, you don't have the giftings that we have. And Paul, Paul writes them in, in response to a bunch of questions they ask him. There's all sorts of questions that they ask him. But he also writes them in response to all of the reports about them that he has heard and said, I cannot believe I've heard this, but this is actually happening among you. And at one point he said, even the pagans around you don't even do this. What are you doing? And what, is, what does Paul do? How does Paul start? He, he, he starts out kind of basically by trying to humble them in reminding them of, once, of what they once were. Remember who you were, right? You could jump over to first, we don't do this, but in, in 1 Corinthians one twenty six, he says, uh, you were basically chosen to shame the proud. Or as I like to say it, uh, you were chosen for illustrative purposes only, right? I picked you on my team so that everybody would know not how great you are at kickball, but how great I am at kickball, right? You were chosen for illustrative purposes so that the grace of God might be shown through you, not, not the greatness of you. That is basically what Paul says to the Corinthians. And remember, their former sins, their former sins were, were everywhere. He, he, he did not have to spend very long to remind them of their former sins. You could look over there in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, right? Where he reminds them of the kind of people that they used to be and had apparently forgotten about. Do, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? We believe that, Paul. We believe that. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor adulter, uh, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And right now you're saying, yeah, I'm so glad I'm not one of those people, right? But then Paul says in verse 11, and such were some of you, right? Right? These sinful characteristics, actions, behaviors characterized you in your former life. But notice this. You once were something, but you now no longer are those things. All those things have been abandoned and been renounced. Notice homosexuality is on that list, right? The thing that we are told is impossible to escape, right? No, but when you come to Christ, you can abandon Everything that opposes the knowledge of God in your life, you can turn away from it. You can renounce it. And, and what Corinthians also encourages us by showing us is it's not going to be perfect, but you can. You can once were those things, but not because of something great you do or some effort you make inside of you to change you, to conform you. That's not why you are changed. No, you do these things because you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God, right? Change is possible, but only in Christ Jesus. 
You're justified. You're made righteous with God. But then also, you are sanctified. You are set apart. And you're washed. You're cleansed. And, and what used to dominate your identity no longer does. You used to be Phil, the thief. You used to be Becky, the drunkard. But now you are not. You are now Phil, the Christian, and Becky, the Christian. Sorry, those were two names that I knew were not in here. They're cheesy, right? But that is what it means to be a Christian. My identity is belonging to Christ. And I don't, I don't call myself the drunkard Christian, just like I don't call myself the homosexual Christian. That is just the logic of this verse. Once again, though, Paul is reminding them of their humble, humble beginnings. Now let's read. <laughs> let's read. Let's read uh, verse 12. Uh, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will uh, do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then... Take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? As he says, the two shall become one flesh, quoting from Genesis. Uh, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now you're like, man, Set me up, David, a little bit. What in the world is Paul talking about? Well, what is he? Well, he seems to be saying two different things at the same time, but what is he talking? Notice, first off, I, I point you to this passage because of how many times Paul mentions the word body. Your body is a significant part of your Christianity, your Christian life. What you do with your body is a significant part of your life. Now, it's, it's clear to me that Paul is, 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 is somehow... Um, quoting some sort of slogans that were running around the uh, Corinthian church. They were saying things like, all things are lawful for me. They were saying things like, food is just food. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, right? My stomach is just an appetite machine, and it doesn't matter what I put into it. And perhaps this slogan was being used by the Corinthians to kind of say, hey, so my stomach is an appetite machine, And my sex drive is an appetite machine. They're probably just the same, and it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what I do with my body. I'm a spiritual being, not a physical being anymore. I'm going to just say all things are lawful for me. It doesn't matter. That appears to be what Paul is addressing. But notice notice that they are minimizing the body. They are minimizing the body in their life, and they are sinning. They're maximizing their freedoms, right? They're saying, I can do everything because what... I do with my body doesn't matter. It's just me and my body, right? And I want to just say this. Right? Paul shows the significance of the body, and we'll, we'll call it three separate metaphors. He, he, he points to the significance of what you do with your body through three separate metaphors. One metaphor for every minute, right? Number one, he, he points to the picture, the metaphor of marriage. He says, think about the seriousness of, of a marriage relationship. The the gospel joins you and your body. The gospel joins you and your body in marriage to Christ. Notice all of this stuff about being freed. Paul is saying, "Ah, but I don't want to be mastered by anything. That's what he says in verse 12. And then notice in verse 13, he says, Your body is not for just anything, not just for any appetites. No, your body is meant to be married, joined to, owned by, belonging to the Lord God. Right? That's what marriage is, right? The two become one. You were saved, in other words, in order to be joined and belong to the Lord. 
The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And notice he backs this up also with this idea of resurrection. You will be raised. Notice you're going to be raised to a new body so that you can belong perfectly to the Lord. Your body matters. You're not free to do whatever you desire. You're free to belong to the Lord. You're free to be joined to the Lord. The gospel is the power of joining you to Christ. Not of just freeing you to do whatever you want. That's the, the marriage metaphor. And then if he, he backs it up by talking about how, how could you then, how could you then, um, being the members of Christ, uh, one body with Christ, go and join yourself to a prostitute. That's reprehensible. That's great sin. And not just sin against yourself, but it's sin against the person who your body belongs to, right? It's spiritual adultery. Adultery is an evil thing. But then notice he also uses another metaphor, and we'll call this one the sanctity of a temple, right? A temple is a place where sacred things are meant to be happening. And and Paul will tell us that the, the gospel sets you apart and your body apart to be a place of worship. That's what a, a temple is. A temple is a place for worship. And he says in verse 19, right, you have become the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. You are now God's place on earth where his glory and his excellence are demonstrated. You and your body show the value and the worth of Christ. That's amazing for a sinner like you and a sinner like I, right? Right? that God wants to declare his glory through you. Now, the Corinthians had boasted in their spiritual nature, right? We're just spiritual beings. It's interesting, though, that that they had totally, totally disregarded the the purpose of their salvation, that that is to bring glory to God. And notice Paul also says this thing, and we don't have enough time to talk about this, but every other sin, verse 18, that a man commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body, as though the the sexually immoral does an extra egregious sin or something like that. And probably what he is saying is, of, of all the sins, yes, sexual immorality is uniquely sinful and uniquely destructive, but ultimately... Ultimately, when you think about yourself as to be a, an object of worship to the Lord or an instrument of worship to the Lord, the greatness of a sexual sin and its inner destructive capabilities is the ultimate dishonoring of the place that was meant to honor Christ. Right? It's, it's, like, it's like taking the temple of the Lord and turning it into an idol, an idol temple. Right? It is the ultimate reversal. It is the ultimate shaming. And yes, this will bring all sorts of consequences into your life. And you can talk about all the destructive uh, tendencies of sexual sin. Sexual sin is by far the most destructive kind of sin that you can think of. But ultimately, it is sinful, ultimately, because it is in a place that's designated for the worship of God. But let's look at the final metaphor. The selflessness of a slave. The gospel purchases you and your body. So you can no longer say, I am my own boss, right? The gospel is is not just freeing you to be free. It's freeing you to belong to someone else, right? And you were purchased. You were bought with a price, he says. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ, as 1 Peter would say. You were purchased with his own blood, as Acts 20, 28 would say. And, And notice the gospel transforms your life. You no longer belong to you, but you are now a slave of Christ. You belong to Christ. See you guys later. Elephant in the room. <laughs> and that's, that's how the Christian thinks about their body, right? I am saved through the gospel that I may be joined to Christ. I didn't get to, to read it, but, man, I really want to. There is this reference from Romans 7. Uh, you, my brothers, were also made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that he might bear fruit to God. You were saved to belong to someone else. And notice you're also saved to be an instrument on earth of God's worship. 
And you were saved to be a slave of Christ. The slave doesn't think about their rights. They simply say, how can I please the master? Now let me just finish with this. How does this help at all? Right? Maybe perhaps you're struggling with things like this and you're saying, man, I don't think that helps me at all. Well, well, first off, notice God has given you a body skillfully and wonderfully with a purpose. He has given you a wonderful body. And your body, although it may str- face struggles, is, 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 actually, is actually created by God to display his image. And I would say the thing that you first need to do, and regardless of where you feel about this, is you first need to say, in a sense, I'm going to love my body. I'm going to appreciate my body. I'm going to even honor my body and carry it with dignity because I've been created by God and with a purpose. I may not be able to see the full purpose, but I am going to give honor to my body and not disregard it, but seek to be a worship, an instrument of worship through it. But also you need to say, as a believer, gloriously, I, I am not my own master. My body belongs to another. And if he chooses, uh, if he chooses anything in my life, I follow him and I submit to his will. But first I belong to him and his grace is sufficient to help me in whatever things I need to handle or conquer or defeat or fight. Even in, even in my fallenness, I can say that I am bought with a price and I'm going to glorify God through my body. Because once again, yes, the Bible holds a high and honorable view of the body, but the gospel demands an even higher and honorable view, right? I'm not just for me. I'm not just for my own satisfaction. I'm, I'm for the honor and the satisfaction of Christ. And that's what I want to seek. That's what I want to seek with my, my entire life. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for on this day that you have made. Thank you for giving it to us. And we pray that we would look on our bodies not with dishonor, but with honor. Not from our interpretation or our lenses, but from your lens and from your interpretation and from your understanding. And I pray that you would even help us to, to live in a way that first seeks to honor our body, seeks to, seeks to say, you, you have made me this way, and I'm going to glorify you without sin in this body that you have given me. Give, give us strength to do this. Give us holiness to do this. Uh, don't let us fall to any desires of the flesh or of the world or of the devil, but help us to stand firm and strong. And we, we pray this all by your grace and, and for your glory. Amen.